Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, and we are navigating the journey. And today, our guest will, with our guest, we will revisit a special edition of Navigating the Journey with the late John Radcliffe. John was on a powerful journey that most of us can only imagine. August 4, John passed the way he wanted, peacefully at home surrounded by family and close friends, ending his life with a prescription we fought for for more than 20 years. With John in mind, the first episode of Navigating the Journey was created in October 2017 for what we call soft sell to the legislature and the public. Navigating the Journey is dedicated to exploring the options and choices for the end of life care, and to assist people to talk about their wishes. It's time to transform our culture so we shift from not talking about dying to talking about it. It's time to share the way we want to live our lives and end our lives. And it's time to communicate about the kind of care we want and don't want for ourselves. We believe that the place for this to begin is not in the intensive care. And together, we explore the various paths to life's ending. Together, we can make those difficult choices. Together, we can make sure that our wishes are respect and respected. We invited various members of religious and traditions, as well as politicians, to talk with us about the end of life customs in their culture. So if you're ready to join us, we ask Navigate the Journey. Our guest today has been with us through this whole journey. Blake Oshiro was our very first guest on our very first show in October, 2017. Blake waved to everybody. Hello, everybody. <laughs> and then there was John, Governor John Wahee. And John, of course, was on our show. We, we were on his show. And John was one of the governors, ex former governors, that wrote this beautiful letter of why the bill should be passed and the importance of it to the community. And then there's Scott Foster. Scott, say hello. Aloha. Scott is the director of the Hawaii Society for Death with Dignity. And Scott has been on this road for more than 20, 30, I don't know how many years. So I've asked those to join us today as we go down and watch the, the video with John. But uh, Blake, uh, would you tell us, since you were our first guest, Tell us about what part journey you've been on to get this where we are today so John Radcliffe could pass peacefully. Yeah, thank you so much, Marsha, for having me on this show and for actually putting on this show to help educate listeners about this journey. You know, back in 1998, Governor Cayetano set up a Blue Ribbon Task Force that looked at the issues around dying. And one of those recommendations was death with dignity that was modeled after the Oregon law. So shortly thereafter in 2000, 2001, um, we tried to pass a bill, we got close, but unfortunately it didn't make it. And so then the bill just kept coming back up and up again. And it took practically 20 years you know, for a bill to finally make it in 2018. One of the big differences was John Radcliffe being sort of the main advocate that people could hear his story. And I think hearing the stories are really, really important. So people saw the journey and understood the pain and the suffering that he wanted to avoid. And so I think it's really, really fitting that at the very end, he got to leave life on his own terms after a seven year battle with cancer it just became to the point where he said, I'm done. And then he got to choose how he exited. And I think it's really, really appropriate 
So I want to thank you for having this show and for paying honor and tribute to John. Thank you. Well, yes, and that's what the whole, all of those years, every week was dedicated to John. So, uh, Governor? Yes. Tell us about you and your role in all of this and that letter from the governors. Well, you know, first of all, I wanted to uh, to say that uh, I've every I've always had theoretically an idea of that this was probably a positive thing, but I never really got into the subject until uh, you know actually until you know, John took up the uh, the cause. And what what's ironic about all of this is for those people out there who may not have met John. He is the most alive person you could go and spend time with. I mean, he, what he was was a person who was always up, buoyant, always positive. I mean, he believed that if some if the mountain had to be moved, he could do it. You know, and so uh, it, it's so juxtapositioned in a sense his personality and the subject matter, which to most people would seem to be very serious, which it is. It's a very serious matter, but I, I would say very, uh, in a sense, you know, dark. But it wasn't to John. No. John, the, the whole cause of what he was talking about was a way of life, actually, a way to live your life and, and a way to um, make it so that you you could go and say, I've done what I want to do. I've moved the mountain, you know, and, and, and it's a happy cause. So I think when John joined the effort, he added a dimension that was lacking. It was maybe not treated as seriously in the past. Now, so that when he was in the middle of uh, lobbying at the legislature to get the bill passed so that uh, people could you know, exit with dignity. Um, he also had relationships with the prior governors, with like myself. I mean, he uh, came to my my show uh, on uh, Think Tech Hawaii, and I think he was with you. And we sat there was, and we yeah. and and we talked about the importance of the bill. But he also knew uh, former Governor Abercrombie. He knew uh, Governor Kaitana. He knew Governor. Um, uh, Ariyoshi, and uh, and when the time came and he needed public support, he asked us whether we would support the bill, and obviously everybody did, and hopefully it helped it helped uh, move the measure along. But it really was his personality. That's my point. He was what? a special person. It was what? his personality dealing with this issue that made it something that people wanted to do. Well, we dedicated this whole, all, every show for three years was about, with John, when I went through all of the files we had on him, all the shows, day after day of watching until I found one that was perfect for today. So, uh, John, thank you. Thank you so much for your continued support. Thank you. And Scott? Scott, are you there? I'm here, yes. Okay. Now, we can't see you. Tell us about the beginning of this journey. Um, I first became involved uh, with the issue uh, just before the AIDS pandemic had really become the monster it later became. Uh, I was philosophically supportive of the issue uh, because I had been working with the National Hemlock Society. And uh, at that time, uh, there were very few of us that went down to the legislature. Uh, but the hero to me is the late Andy Vandervoort. Andy, uh, uh, a lady, uh, a nurse, registered nurse, uh, Andy Vandervoort, uh, who brought me to the issue uh, kind of full term uh, after AIDS hit. 
and of course, so many of my friends uh, uh, were suffering from AIDS that uh, I was wholeheartedly for the issue. And uh, as we went along, it grew slowly and surely, and every year we added more and more people. And uh, uh, but uh, I, I must I must say that had Andy Vandervoort uh, not been working with the uh, Hemlock Society and brought me to the issue, I would have probably just shrugged my shoulder and said, "So what?" But uh, it, it, so it uh, the issue has been fulminating for I don't know 30 years anyway, and. Uh, uh, I was very grateful to have been included in this gathering of folks who each played their own own part in the history of this very important issue. Uh, now, uh, now that it's law and has been operative for s several years, uh, I guess we can all pat ourselves on the back for having that faith in people like Andy Vandervoort and Uncle Jugi Heen. I've got to mention Uncle Jugi Heen, who, who uh, uh, was very involved early on. Uh, there's a whole list of them. Uh, they're on our website, uh, the Hawaii Death with Dignity Society, if anyone wants to know the history. Uh, once we pass the bill, I kind of have stepped away from it and uh, let nature take its course as it as it would be. But thank you to all and anyone who was involved in those early years, and uh, certainly John Ratcliffe, uh, who played a key role at a key time. Uh, thank you for inviting me and including me in this group. Well, thank you, Scott. And now we shall see the video with John. And, um, Again, thank you, Scott and Blake and Governor Wahee for joining us. And um, now we'll go to see John. I am so happy to have you. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know, I can't imagine that there's anybody in Hawaii that doesn't know John. He has been here since when, 40 years now? Well, yeah, I came here in 1975 uh, to run the State Teachers Union, and I did that for 13 years. Um, and following that, I uh, ran for Congress in 1988. Uh, I lost, which was a very good thing for me. Uh, it really helped me a lot uh, in life. Um, and then I settled in and started um, operating the University of Hawaii Professional Assembly. Uh, J.N. Musto and I uh, pretty much ran that organization for uh, 17 years and he for 30, you know. Um, and then I retired from that and um, I've been a lobbyist for since around 1990 or so. So I do a lot of lobbying and I've been at the legislature now for, you're right, 41 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Have, have I known you that long? I guess well, it has I think been. so. Yes. Like, we've <laughs> known each other a long time. A long time. We were doing civil rights stuff together back before when we were trying to get a Martin Luther King Day uh, here. Yes. Uh, uh, when it was very tough to get people to come out. It was. And we also did a lot of stuff um, for gay rights and stuff when it was not very popular. Are we always on that side? <laughs> uh, well, we're. On, Yes, yes. yes Marsha and I are both uh, card-carrying Democrats and liberals. Um, so that's just the way that is. Yes. Well, but we want to talk about you today because you are venturing down a journey, a path that most of us uh, have seen, have had family members, but we don't get to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Now, the paper said that you actually had your chemo treatment while you were the guest at the legislature, opening of the legislature. Week, yeah. So how does that work? What, well, what, it, what? It, it, it is something I, you, it was hard to, to see it. I mean, you could see it on me if you looked, but I didn't make a big, big deal of it. What happens is that on, when I have chemo, it's three days of chemo, not just a minute. 
So I go down on a given day, in this case a Tuesday, and I put about five hours in when they infuse me with these chemicals. And then they take the infusion stuff off and they plug me into a um, machine that meters chemo into me every 90 seconds for two days. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was doing on the floor. I'm sitting there with a, uh, a bag here that, that meters chemo directly into my system and then the next day I get it removed and then I get sick for, <laughs> for a few days and then about today uh, after all that goes through that was last week now by today I'm pretty good you I'm look, tired but I'm you look pretty good. great I'm pretty good it's it, it's a lot of chemo um, I don't know how much more I'll be able to take but I'm is there a limit? Right now, it's working. But there's no, there's, there's, with, with, with cancer, there's a reason that it's called the emperor of diseases because it has a thousand, a million ways to transform itself, to move itself around in your body and do things to you. So you have to be constantly watching for things. I mean, it might be fingernails, it might be sores, it might be you know, eruptions, it might, uh, skin eruptions, it might be terrible pain in your gut, it might be, it might be anything. It could, you could go, you know, half, half blind and stuff. It, various and sundry things happen to you when you have chemo because there are side effects and, and they're not very, they're not very pleasant. Mm -hmm. um, the question about life here and, and the thing that, that we all should be thinking about is, What's the quality of it? How long can you stand it? Um, I've argued that what I've gone through and what I know that others have gone through who have suffered and suffered much worse than, than even I have been suffering. Um, and painful, terrible, terrible things. Um, uh, where was I going with that? I can't remember where I was going with that because you know, it gets me in the a, in a, in a head. But, but um, you know, I, I realize that that, 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 that that happens and people don't talk about that, the quality of life that's left to you at the end. Right. Are you going to lay there in bed, exhausted and in pain and suffering um, or not? Can you get better? How long can you stay better? That sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I get out and walk as much as I can. I yeah. exercise as much as I can. I think people can see that um, I'm making an effort. I do not want to die, but I'm dying. So I'm not a fool. Um, I think we have to understand what the thing is and deal with it. Yes. And I'm dealing with it. Um, it's unfortunate in life that not a lot of people want to confront this, I guess, ugly fact. Yes. I am willing to do it. I've always been willing to be the guy, if I have to, to do it. So well, there you go. I'm a cancer survivor, and I know that pit of your stomach when, when the doctor says this is what, what it is. And it's really a difficult, mentally, yeah. as well as physically and mentally to deal with this is what's going on right. and uh, so I'm really honored to have you to talk about it your willingness to talk about it and you are uh, as always which is in your DNA to lobby for uh, the ability to have medical aid in dying yeah. So, let's talk about what is medical aid in dying. Right. What it is, is a, a legal prescription um, that will allow a patient to personally take that medicine, not being given to it, but have to take it themselves. Um, uh, the, uh, it's not the doctor that does it. You do it if you feel you need it, when you feel you need it with your family around you and so forth. That's what that's about, so that the doctor doesn't go to jail for doing that, okay? Right. Um, what do you mean go to jail? Well, right now, uh, it's not legal for doctors to prescribe uh, medicine which will end a person's life. It's just not legal in the state of, of 
Hawaii. It's legal in six other states, not legal here. It's being, um, it's in approximately 20 more legislatures this year as a, in addition to our own. So that's almost half the states in the union are involved in this. And it's, it's something which is moving nationwide because as in some other issues that have occurred socially, this is one in which the minds of America have changed over the years. Uh, for example, we've done a poll here in Hawaii just recently, which indicated that 80% of the people of Hawaii would like to have this. 20% have problems with it. Only about 12% of people in Hawaii are adamantly opposed to uh, having this option. Now, I guess my how it is how is it okay for a doctor to turn off the ventilator in the hospital? How is it okay for the doctor to prescribe morphine, give her as much as she needs? How is it right. that they can do terminally sedation, and that's okay, but to write a prescription for a person to take it themselves is not okay? Well, now, it's a Let's. We're we're. I think we we have a situation in which medicine has uh, become better over the years to such a degree that we can be kept alive indefinitely for a very very long time. Anyway, uh, with nothing else going on than artificial stuff keeping you going, that we can do. Uh, but we still have um, a prejudice against uh, allowing people to control their own lives at the end. That is just a prejudice that uh, is in the medical field. Mm -hmm. um, I understand it. It comes with the Hippocratic Oath, do no harm. Uh, but, you know, a little common sense would be useful uh, would. with the do no harm part. And I think doctors have, it, most of the doctors that I talk to support this option. Uh, none of them that I know of except for Chuck and a few others are willing to come out and talk about it. Chuck he's, is your doctor? Yes, Chuck. Yeah. And uh, he, um, he's the uh, um, other guy on the suit with me. And then, oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so let's talk about it. You just said suit. You are yeah. suing? Yeah. We're, we're also uh, suing in court to determine what the law is. Um, we have had two attorneys general in the state of Hawaii. Uh, the last one, David Louie, and the current one, Doug Chin, uh, who have indicated that the current status of the law does not allow doctors to proceed uh, with, with uh, providing that medication. Uh, and be assured that they were not going to be prosecuted. So we are going to the courts to say, is that the way you see the law? The attorney general opines this, you be the judge, so you say. So, but I saw uh, Mr. Louie yeah. say, well, he did backtrack and he said, well, if there are enough safeguards, then he felt it would be okay. Sure, and there are plenty of safeguards. This is very specific legislation. The legislation, uh, you have to be of sound mind. Mm -hmm. You have to have less than six months to live. Um, and there have to be two doctors that have to say that. Um, you've got to have, you know, two doctors willing to say that they're go ahead with this. Uh, you, you, there's all sorts of, of safeguards in it. Uh, it would be pretty much like the Oregon law. Uh, which has worked now perfectly, perfectly, for 20 years. Aloha, and we're back with a dear, dear friend that I will preface his name by saying survivor. <laughs> Thank you. John has been a survivor of polio. Yes. TB, TB. polio, virtually every other childhood disease known to man. Uh, but survived most of it. The worst of, the, of those was the polio. Uh, I had polio when I was eight uh, and was paralyzed for about three months, um, fully recovered from that, and that was wonderful. That was, that was 
the most difficult childhood thing, but it did help me become a terrific reader. <laughs> Very good. So that's good. Yeah. That, so that's why I'm calling him Survivor, and he's going to survive this also. Oh, yeah. Oh, I yeah. mean, uh, now, in terms of what you mean by survival, uh, is my, my body going to survive this? Um, no. Uh, uh, what's going to happen is that uh, my, my body is, uh, al is already gone. I mean, it's, uh, I was given uh, six months to live two years, almost three years ago. Um, I've been working very hard on staying alive. Uh, but uh, trend lines don't go that way. Um, the question is, and people seriously say this to me, well, what about a miracle? Yeah, I'm, I'm, happy. I'm open for a miracle. I'm, I'm up okay. for that. I would like a miracle. Good. Well, let's have but, a miracle, you know, okay? If it happens, that'd be great. But in the meantime? In the meantime, uh, I think I've got to take action to, because uh, I know it's coming. Well, we all, we all do. I've been there. Yeah. I mean, I've been we, there. We all, and, th uh, there is an end to it. And there, we one, all, of these, one of these days, it's going to be the end. So, um, you know, folks, it's, and it's not that everybody dies, and uh, that's not the important thing. The important thing is what did you do when you were alive? Did you do the best you could when you were alive? for the most people that you could, you know? Were you helpful? Were you a good neighbor? That, that's the kind of thing that makes a difference. So let's talk about the bill um, sure. that is before the legislature. And if, us, well, and simply put, what can we do? <laughs> Thank you for asking that question, because uh, Marcia and I are both smiling at that, because <laughs> this is an organizing uh, question. If you believe that you have a right to determine, under certain circumstances, your own method of death uh, because of pain and suffering and things that cannot be otherwise prevented, if you believe in that, then you got to organize and you got to get down to the legislature and you got to make a scene because they are going to do a nothing, nothing, unless there's some reaction from the people. They don't care about the fact that 80 to 88 percent of people in Hawaii want it, that uh, Catholics and other Christians are now supported. Uh, it's troublesome to have to take up these tough social issues. So unless people say, take it up, they're not going to take it up. They're going to fool around. So I urge every single person out there watching this, if you know a legislator, call a legislator. Call a legislator. Talk to a legislator. Every single one of them you know, find out how they stand on this. And if they're against it, move them toward it. If they're for it, thank them and get their vote. Uh, just to let you know, well, you know this, it, only in Hawaii, although all of the legislators, all the city council people, all of the OHA trustees, their phone numbers are listed. Their doors are not locked. Go, call, be there. If you feel this is something that you can benefit. Now, you know, we, the, it's the, he doesn't want to go, but it's the cancer that's, that's taking him away from us. And so we need to not only support John, but hundreds of other people in the same condition. Yeah. I watched my mother. She had emphysema. And, you know, she, you can't breathe. And every breath she labored for a year and having to watch her, because we had her at home with hospice, it tore me up. Just I, Marcia, I got to tell you, again, folks that are watching this, because I'm in this situation now, people call me all the time, and it's the damnedest thing. Uh, people are calling me for things that happened in their families 25 years ago that they feel guilty about mm -hmm. today. That I, 
People have called me that are crying themselves to sleep at night now. What they did or didn't do, didn't do. 25 years mm -hmm. ago and still with them. Um, you know, that's not right. No. I mean, that's not fair for people. And it's just time, folks. You, and, you know, I, 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 say to, I say to the people, ask, ask your own moms and dads out there how they feel about it mm -hmm. and uh, talk to them. The, the title of the bill is Relating to Aid in Dying. Yes. And it's HB, House Bill number 201. Right. Is there, there a be, Senate bill? There will be a Senate bill. There's a companion bill coming out of the Senate. I can't remember the number offhand. Uh, but it's uh, should it's out now. I think it's a la today's the last day for introduction. I think it's out today. Yes, so. uh, Senator Inouye. Uh, yeah, Senator Inouye's got Lorraine Inouye. Lorraine's got a House or Senate Bill five something, but I'm not sure. Yeah. And and Not the number. Yeah. So, but we do need your support. We do need you to call, to write, to visit, do whatever you need to do. Now, there's also. This is either, we this, need this. Well, this is not just. It's really not about me. Yeah. Okay, I'm over with in that sense. Uh, this is about other people. The reason I decided to do it is because I I knew that other people needed to have this done. And as I I sit with chemo patients all the time, and, you know it's it's rough just getting up and walking around for most chemo patients. Mm -hmm. uh, so they can't do this. Uh, and then, then they weren't going to do it anyway. I mean, it wasn't their thing. It's, uh, you know, I'm the kind of guy that stands on the street corner and says, hey, the people, look at this. I did it when yeah. the Civil Rights Movement, I did it for the Vietnam War, I've done it for teachers, I've done it for university professors, I've done it for all my clients. Be fair, you know, mm -hmm. and um, that's what this is about. Well, me trying to help you know, others get a fair shot. I think that just seeing you willing to talk about it, willing to be vulnerable, willing to put yourself out mm -hmm. there, so that the rest of us can say. Yeah, here's somebody that really knows what they're talking about. It's not somebody that says, well, if. Right. No, this is real. Your, your listeners might be interested or watchers might be interested to know that I also spent 10 years on the Employee Union Health Fund Trust Board. Um, some of that time as the chair of, the, of that. And that's a, the largest public sector uh, health trust in the state of Hawaii. Um, and so I know a good deal about how health insurance works and, and, and what it's about. This is extremely costly uh, for the state as well. Uh, I thank God that uh, I have uh, Medicare and, and am able to, you know, to get through this uh, because I I'm also have insurance. Mm -hmm. If I didn't have insurance, uh, this wouldn't be an issue because it's costing, uh, to keeping me alive is costing thousands of dollars a week. You know? Yes, nationwide statistics say that Medicare spends more on people at the end of their yeah. lives and all of their lives. And it's estimated that one day in the hospital with what you're doing is a $10,000 a day. Oh yeah, and I've been in lots of days. Yes, so. I've been in lots of days, so I've, yeah. Um, now, now let's let's separate this. We don't want you to think that oh, it's costing so much money, so we're going to get rid of grandma. No, <laughs> no, no, no. Let's do not confuse the issues. Go back and look at the legislation. Yeah, let's, legislation let's, yeah. is very clear. <laughs> yeah. So this isn't something that somebody does to somebody. <laughs> yeah. So let's 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 clean that up. Don't don't think for a moment. That you often hear that. I know. Yeah, if you, you know. Often, oh, well, we couldn't do that, you know, because. Uh, yeah, 
So no. I wouldn't trust my own siblings. Oh, <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> Uh, well, but seriously, Grandma's estate is gone by the time you get through this, the medical cost. We're not talking about Grandma. So we're, so we're not talking. <laughs> so we're not doing that. Okay, so don't go there. Don't even think about that. This is your choice that you get to do for yourself, and nobody else gets to make that choice. Nobody else gets to make that decision. So right. don't let anybody scare you and say, oh, we're going to do this. No. This is your choice, and it is about your choice. It is about each one of us. We get to choose who we're going to marry. We get to choose who we go to school with, when we go to this place, when we go on vacation. We get to choose. So we should be allowed to choose when the illness has taken the quality of life away from you, when there is no choice when there's nothing else that medical can do for you, you need to be right. able to make that choice. So, right. without, we, this, without this choice, my end, my choice is, is, is going to be what, the, what, what I'm left with, which is starvation. Well, don't do it yet. <laughs> we need you for uh, a while. So listen. please. Aloha. Thank you, thank you all for being with us over the years to support John. We did finally get a bill passed, our care, our choice. And in, uh, it took effect in 19, 2019. To think of all the years and all the people. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't know what else to say. But in honor of John and all of the people that work so hard to make it happen. Hello. And we'll see you next time.